Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello. Today, I say with a big smile on my face, we are going to talk <laughs> about conflict, aka fighting, how to fight fair, and is it outside? Is it inside? What exactly are we talking about, and how do we deal with it? You know, sometimes when we broach a topic, what I'll do is I'll go to my Kindle version of the Collected Works and just text search the word. And conflict is a word that appears many, 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 many times hmm. in the Collected Works. So we want to talk about outer conflict, which is pretty self-explanatory. We all have conflicts all the time. We have conflicts in our marriages. We have conflicts with our business partners. We have conflicts with our friends. We, of course, never have conflicts with our podcast partners. That just that oh, doesn't work. Pure, pure peace. <laughs> but, um, but we're also interested today in looking at inner conflict. And this is usually Jung being such an introvert and his psychology being such an introverted mm -hmm. psychology. Most of the time when he's talking about conflict, he's talking about an inner conflict. So before we go sallying mm -hmm. forth, let's just... Define for a second, what do we mean by an inner conflict? How do we think about that? I think that is one of the hardest things we ever have to do. Uh, we are hardwired for relationship with others. And we start out that way. We grow inside an other person's body. Uh, Babies and toddlers need the other person to hold them and feed them and comfort them. So we go out there again and again and again uh, because that's where my conflict is. It's with so-and-so. Um, let's say it's a boss. And it's true that the boss does this and that and the other thing, and you have all kinds of incidents and evidence, lots and lots of data about what he said, how he looked, how he stomped into your office, and it's all true. And now it's going to be very hard to bring that inside. What does that set off in me? What is it that drives me so crazy? What's getting sparked? Of, and what can I do about engaging this with my boss? And how do I engage it in myself when it seems so obvious that it's about him or her? So you have tough question of what is inner conflict. Well, well, I think when we're talking about inner conflict, in a sense, we're talking about ambivalence, right? Mm -hmm. That maybe part of you wants to stop smoking, for example, <laughs> but another part of you really doesn't. Yeah, And I think what can be tricky is that we're not aware that we're at war with ourselves. And so then we kind of project it out. And I'll give you an example that I think I've probably used before on the podcast. So it's a little bit tried and true, but it's a good one. So when my youngest child was about a year old, it was kind of time to start thinking about trying for a third baby if we were going to do that because I was not a spring chicken. <laughs> um, and so I wanted a third baby. So I said to my husband, I said, you know, come on, let's, let's get going here. And he's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't really know that I want another one. I was like, oh, come on. You know, we talked about this and <laughs> you know, we, we want another baby, right? I mean, don't you want another baby? And he's like, I, I don't know. So we, we would have it out. And I was always on one side of the argument and he was always on the other. And then <laughs> one day he said, you know, maybe I do want a third baby. 
And all of a sudden I was like, oh shit. <laughs> Do I want a third baby? <laughs> and it, it, was, it was as long as he was holding one pole, I didn't have to know about my inner conflict that I both wanted a third child and didn't want a third child. I didn't have to countenance my inner conflict about that. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to wrestle with, I know part of me really, really wants this and another part of me is not so sure at all. Uh, I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't have to be, it was, you know, ambivalence is uncomfortable. And so whenever Uh we can project out our inner conflict on someone else and fight the person out there about it, we are relieved of the discomfort of our own ambivalence. Mm -hmm. So when my husband was like, no, no third baby, I was like, I I just could revel in the the part of me that wanted it. But as soon as he said, well, maybe we should put this on the table, I, I had to suddenly take back my ambivalence. And yeah. I had to sit with it and I had to think, do I really want this? So that's part mm-hmm. of how I think. About, I mean, I think inner conflict can mean lots of things. And Jung, again, spoke a lot about inner conflict. He yeah. said it was inevitable and that we're always in a state of inner conflict, that that is the kind of normative position of the psyche. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so it's something to become acquainted with. Mm-hmm. I think it goes to Jung's idea of the multiplicity, that we live in a multiplicity outside, great complex systems that we're embedded in, and we live in a multiplicity inside of ourselves, a great Mm -hmm. complexity that we reside in, and contending for dominance, really. Which drives, which ideas, which even creative impulse will take the lead and consequently subdue or sublimate other mm-hmm. agendas is, is a vying process that we're in all the time. And sometimes we do that very skillfully and elegantly, and <laughs> many times less so. So, so I want to go back to um, an example that's less clear-cut than uh, an inner conflict at least you know it's yours, about should mm-hmm. I quit smoking or not? I, I really know I should, uh, and yet it's I don't, I do, and I don't. Uh, the conflict, let's say, uh, with a boss, where it seems so clearly out there, it's like you, you wanting a third baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as long as your husband was holding the other pole, then it's out there. A- and the you might say, why does this get under my skin so much? You know, maybe the whole department knows that he's temperamental or uh, demanding or, or uh, uh, any one of a hundred million things. But what is it in me that gets this under my skin? Uh, it doesn't seem to affect other people quite as much as it affects me. So what is lighting up inside that is my own conflict, my own ambivalence, my own upset uh, with somebody who's clearly just being himself and is who he is? But it's, it's all going in the direction of we have to bring it inside ourselves and deal with our multiplicity, deal with our own inner polarities, deal with our own inner ambivalence. And sometimes that means, first of all, we have to identify what it is that's going on inside us. Uh, what is it about this that, that's getting me? So one of the ways that we might lean into that question is perhaps to, to examine it with a slightly different descriptive word that I find a little bit more useful, which is Mm. strife. Mm. Conflict and strife are are kind of synonyms, but the reason I like the word strife is that, yes, it means discord and quarreling and fighting, but the root of the word is strive. Mm. And so when I think about when I'm in conflict or strife, that 
I am striving for something. Yeah, and it has a perspective. Strife, yes, it has oh, a telos great. to yeah. it. So, yes. And in the striving, the other strivings inside of me, the great striving horde, are competing <laughs> for resources. You know, uh, the part of me that likes smoking, which might be the part of me that's striving for comfort. And somehow mm-hmm. smoking is comforting. Well, that's a striving. But there's another part of me that's striving to be healthier and to protect myself from future illness. And so these two strivings are looking at each other, mm-hmm. trying to figure out which, which striving is going to take the lead. Right. That is and lovely. Yeah. And that's really Jung great. saying, it's the old story of the hammer and the anvil. Yeah. Of holding the tension, holding the polarities, of hammering it out between you and you or me and me, of which striving is going to take precedence, the immediate gratification of smoking or future health benefits, longevity, et cetera. Which one? And by asking what is the striving, we also get a chance mm-hmm. to drop a little bit below the outer seeming of it. So, for uh-huh. instance, not to put you on the spot, Lisa, but in the idea uh-huh. of the third trial, child, you also ask, well, what, am, what, what is the striving? Is the striving yeah. to hold on to how beautiful it was to be pregnant, which I remember you telling me years uh-huh. ago just how, how much you loved the experience of being pregnant and, and what that did to your psyche. I, I do. I remember you saying that. I think that in, retros- in retrospect, you know, it may seem that. less so. Oh, goodness, I, I do. Uh, or, or the other fantasies uh, kind of around that. So in the conflict, to ask, let's say in mediation, for instance, this is a very common piece, mm-hmm. you know, I... I want the living room couches. No, I want the living room couches and the divorce. But is it really about the couches? <laughs> is right, it really about exactly. who's going to get the dog? Are, are we striving to punish the other person? Are we striving for power? Are we striving for any number of different things? And without, without the striving being revealed, we can spend so much time in the outer seeming of things and I know, Deb, yes. you've said many times that the thing we're fighting about is not the thing. Mm-hmm. There's another thing. Right. And this is where yes. it is such a psychoanalytic consideration because we waste so much energy fighting around these proxy issues. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, exa- right. and it's exhausting. Can I come in with the quote that you referenced a minute ago? Because it's such a good one, and you know I love my quotes. Um, <laughs> so this is Jung. But since the unconscious factors act as determinants no less than the factors that regulate the life of society and are no less collective, I might just as well learn to distinguish between what I want and what the unconscious thrusts upon me as to see what my office demands of me and what I myself desire. As the, at first, the only thing that is cl- at all clear is the incompatibility of the demands coming from without and from within, with the ego standing between them as between hammer and anvil. Mm-hmm. But over against this ego, tossed like a shuttlecock between outer and inner demands, there stands some scarcely definable arbiter which I would on no account label with the deceptive name conscience, although taken in its best sense, the word fits that arbiter very aptly indeed. So, uh, you know, the, the, part of this is that what Jung is saying is that the ego is the one that has to figure out what's to do with the demands of the outer world and the inner world. And, and so, in a sense, the ego is always in conflict. Mm. Say more about that. Let's unpack that. Maybe there's some examples we could give. Yeah. Well, and I think, Joseph, back to what you were saying before I read the quote, you know, when you brought up the example of, of my pregnancy, kind of saying, like, what, what is the unconscious urge to do this? Mm-hmm. Where is that coming from? So that 
you know, if something like, I mean, now I guess we'll just run with it. If, you know, it's like, do I want a third child? Well, there might be the, the, the impulse coming from within, and it might be uh, any number of things. It might be, I was a third child. I've always known I wanted three kids. It could be, mm-hmm. gosh, I loved having little ones. I, I want that to continue. It could be, you know, just a vague sense that the family doesn't feel complete. It could be outer demands, you know, like uh, my family, you know, I come from a family where everyone has a lot of kids. And if I stop Mm -hmm. at two, I'm going to be considered kind of an underachiever. Or, uh, you know, (laughs) oh my God, (laughs) you know, this is, but but there could be building your portfolio of babies. (laughs) 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 But it, but it, you know, but there could be outer things going on too, right? Uh, you know, maybe I don't know what I'm going to do when the kids all get old enough to go to back to school. Yep. And so this will kind of postpone that decision. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it could be any number of things. So to be aware that the ego is standing in between in- inner forces and outer forces and is trying to be the arbiter mm-hmm. of right. those sometimes often competing demands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jung also says, you know, to let each side have its full say. Yes. Of, of the part that wants another child and the part that maybe doesn't or what's going, what's going on here. Sometimes I find it helpful to sort of uh, reconsider this as a negotiation. Mm-hmm. It turns the heat down a little bit. Of like, okay, you know, we're just negotiating. Uh, one part wants to go out for Chinese food and the other part, you know, wants to order in pizza. Well, that's not so heated. But can you take something that has more heat and turn it into a little bit of a negotiation? Because then it's easier to be curious about it rather than having a lot just intense feeling. Well, and I think that goes to Joseph's point. Joseph, I just love that, replacing the word conflict with strife. It's really great. Conflict mm-hmm. comes from the Latin for to strike together. So it really focuses ah. on the um, clash. <laughs> but right. strife, you're right, really focuses on the, the kind of the prospect of, you know, we're, we're, well, it legitimizes both sides, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. And then that becomes, Deb, what you're talking about. Can we be curious about the other side? Can we give each its yeah. due? It's just a negotiation. Now, you know, it is more than that, but it ha- it, all these ways are ways to approach it differently so that it's not like, oh my God, here we go, what a conflict, but just, huh, let's get interested here. Let's just go ahead and go toe-to-toe and, and hash it out between me and me or between me and you. And Jung gives us a really extraordinary um hint. And it comes Mm -hmm. from his alchemical writings, but he also says it in other places in the collected works, is that the unconscious is always scripting a fantasy of its own. (laughs) So that often there is a powerful fantasy that is somewhere in me and somewhere in the other person. So and I'm working a lot like this in my practice. I didn't used to, but I really understand it now. People will bring up a conflict, and I'll start with, um, so, so what would you like to see happen? Well, I just want to go mm. and tell that person that this piece of my <laughs> mind. And so I just ask them to fantasize and say, okay, so what would you say? Yeah, and then yeah, they'll... Yeah. They'll start getting very uncomfortable first of like, what are you doing? I'm like, no, I just want it, like, bring it out. And then I'll say like, well, then what would happen? What do you mean? (laughs) This script's been written already. Like, it's so clear. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. You're thinking about somewhere. It's not a choice. And so what happens is, and then what would happen? And then what would happen? And then what would happen? And there's a whole um, trajectory, a whole fantasy where this is going to go and often where it leads 
um, is a surprise to the ego. Mm. It's a re- there's a relief of tension. But when we see where the fantasy wants to lead, then we have a sense mm-hmm. to ask, is this the only way to get there? No, oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and this goes to what we were saying before of it. The thing we're fighting about is often not the thing, but getting to the real thing mm-hmm. is actually um, takes mm-hmm. a lot of trust and a certain um, relaxation into that um, light meditation state to follow mm-hmm. your fantasy mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. So that's one way of mm-hmm. beginning to figure out what the telos is of the tension in the room. That's great, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really, so that's it, really lovely. It's actually the conflict of fantasies. Mm. It's the war of fantasies that is going on. And so even if I think about the pizza that you brought up, <laughs> there's a part of it's like, oh, I want to order the large pizza and I want to eat it all myself. But there's another part <laughs> of me that, that's fantasizing about what I'm going to look like when I put that bathing suit on you know, come June. And uh, both, of them, <laughs> both of them have fantasies that are spinning forward and they are leading to other pla- different places <laughs> at the end of those boxes of pizza that are piling up, uh, you know, mm-hmm. in the garage. And, and Joseph, uh, just to pick up on that in a way, to talk about the sort of telos of conflict, Saffron Rossi in her book on the Core has a lovely line. She says, in every symptom, conflict, or problem, there is a God attempting to communicate with us. Mm. Yes, yes. Beautiful. Super beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, when when I think of internal conflicts again, sometimes they're insoluble. And Jung talked a lot about Mm -hmm. the insoluble dilemma or the insoluble conflict and kind of said when you you reach the point where you can't solve it, that is you can't solve it with the ego, you can't solve it with the conscious mind, you wind up turning it over to the unconscious. And that's when you learn your dependence on the unconscious. And that's also when something new can come forward in the form of the transcendent function which which you know jung described as uh this unconscious factor that can resolve a conflict in a surprising way something arises organically that the the unconscious could not come up with but the thing about the transcendent function is you have to be able to stay in the conflict Mm-hmm. So if if you feel, for example, just a terrible um, suffering in your marriage, and you want it, and you want to leave, but another part of you feels like uh, I don't know that you can't possibly do that to your spouse. Let's say real, and it's you're really suffering, and you don't know the answer, and you sort of give it over to the unconscious. Then something new and surprising will eventually. Mm-hmm. Uh, arise out of that conflict, but you, you can't collapse into a kind of neurotic uh, flattening of the conflict. You have to feel the suffering and stay in the conflict. And in the suffering, pay great attention to the images, dreams, body sensations that are coming up. Because initially, the ego wants to focus the conflict, let's say, on the spouse. So we just keep circumambulating on the outer object. But Mm -hmm. internally, we're having an enormous amount of inner dialogue and fantasies and memories. And it's in dropping into that phantasmagoria that's uh, underneath Mm -hmm. the conflict (laughs) that we begin to um, loosen up some of the energies and become curious about, frankly, how complicated our conflicts are. We tend to want to oversimplify them. Well, if only my damn husband would take out the trash or clean up the garage, then everything would be fine. And and maybe it would be fine in a certain way, but (laughs) it would be better. But there's 
the fact that we're so stormy about it lets us know that there's a lot, yes. of, a lot of other critters in the forest, right. you know, that are moving yes. around underneath all of this. Right. So, um, what I'm really noticing that's coming up is there are two things. One is the difference between what I think about as the horizontal axis, mm. which is the part that's between me and somebody else. And uh, that that's where I locate the conflict. But there's not a whole heck of a lot often that I can really do about that because mm -hmm. we don't control the other person. We don't even control a baby that's a week old. And that baby is crying, and you have done everything you can think of, uh, feeding, diaper changing, singing, rocking, holding, uh, and the baby is still crying. And the other axis is the vertical axis, which is the one that's between me and me. And when we bring it in to what is going on in me, what does this really mean to me? How does this tap into my memories, experience, values, etc.? There is empowerment there. Mm. And yes, we have to suffer the inner conflict. But we have power mm -hmm. to change our attitude, to understand it differently. And what you were saying, Lisa, to have that uh, transcendent function come up, that instead of doing this or that, which I, should we order in Chinese or should we order in pizza, um, the, the answer might be something else altogether. Of right. You know what? Let's go to a movie. We right. don't even need food at all. <laughs> Um, and it's something that you can't just think your way through it. If you could think your way through it, you would do that. Then most of the time, mm -hmm. that's not so hard. So we have to wait and suffer ourselves and, right. and you know, bring it on in. Uh, like the old Sam Cooke song, <laughs> bring it on home to me. So what I'm sensing in our conversation is, as Jungians, we recognize that the outer symptoms of our lives almost always have, a, at the very least, an inner correlate, if not an inner mm -hmm. cause. And we <laughs> often talk about how to drop into the fantasy, paying attention to our dreams, which are often commenting, we have a terrible fight at work. In the next one to three days, you're very likely to have a dream that's going to try to illuminate some dimension mm -hmm. of the tensions inside of you that you're not aware of. But there are mm -hmm. also outer skills that can be developed in terms of navigating interpersonal conflict. And I'm sure that we all have a, mm -hmm. some advice for people in terms of how to stand interpersonally with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's, <laughs> I, I, I like the, the turning um, you've just pointed to, Joseph, of, you know, how, there are conflicts in the outer world with people, and we do need skills to deal with them. And what, what are they? Mm -hmm. um, it, there is an outer world, and um, this is where uh, uh, Gestalt stuff has had a lot of influence over me. and. Uh, you know, there are certain sort of uh, guidelines, rules of the road. Only use I statements is one mm -hmm. of them. You start a sentence with the word you. Oops. Why don't you ever? Why did you do? Well, how come you? Whoops. We're into blaming and shaming, and the other person's going to get defensive. So if you say, I feel upset, I'm angry, you know, uh, we agreed that this would happen and it hasn't happened. And you can use a you statement only to report objective, behavioral, uh, verifiable data of, uh, um, you, you know, I'll use your example of cleaning out the garage. You know, we agreed we would work together on the garage this weekend. And you went out to do this, then you had a game of tennis with your friend, then blah, 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 blah. 
And so you have been away most of the day, and we haven't gone into the garage. But the tone has to simply be repertorial, objective, here are the facts. And then you can say, I'm upset. I feel dissed. I feel disappointed. And that, by the way, is is a very big category of disappointment rather than, you know, yes, I might feel at first that I'm that I'm angry and you you betrayed me and you no, I am disappointed. I had a hope, I had a striving. And it didn't happen. And I am powerless over that. The day is gone now. Disappointment is very, very big, and we avoid it uh, in service to uh, directing feeling at the other person. Hello, listeners. I want to take just one minute to remind you about my upcoming women's fairy tale and yoga retreat. We have just a few tickets left. It is April 25th through April 28th in central Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful time of year to be there. It's a great group of women. We have a ton of fun. We hang out. We do yoga. We talk about fairy tales. We eat good food. Uh, We tell stories and share poems around the campfire. Uh, We do some dream incubation. It's a really great time. So if you're interested, pop on over to my website, lisamarciano.com, where you can read more about Women's Wellspring Retreat. Thanks. I love that word because, you know, it's, uh, it starts with the word appointment. Like, we had an appointment <laughs> to clean the garage, uh, and, and mm. now all of a sudden there's a disappointment. Like, the appointment, That's great. the anti-appointment has actually occurred, mm. and, uh, <laughs> and I am noticing that you missed your appointment. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which makes sense. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And I am upset. Mm. That's my own internal reaction. Maybe mm-hmm. somebody else wouldn't care quite as much. It wouldn't be such a big deal. I am feeling these feelings. All the garages of our lives mm-hmm. that remain um, mm-hmm. unclean. Unaddressed. <laughs> yeah. Unclean. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You know, uh, we, all, we all have ways, too, of avoiding, of avoiding conflict. And uh, we were going to touch on that of, woo, it's very easy to avoid conflict. Yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think avoidance is a big issue. I think we've actually done a whole podcast on it. But avoiding mm-hmm. conflict with others, avoiding the conflict with ourselves by projecting it out and displacing it onto other people. But yeah, to pick up that word, Deb, avoiding conflict uh, with each other is, uh, a, a, you know, may seem like a good choice in the short term, but long term, it uh, doesn't work so well, especially if it's something important. I mean, I think mm-hmm. my husband once at one point told a friend that um, the secret to a good marriage is to just let a lot of things slide. <laughs> but Ugh. but um, but there are more sub substantive issues that you that you can't do that with you know that Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. you will you will do damage to yourself and to the relationship if you avoid the conflict yes you you do damage to yourself by not being authentic uh you're hiding from yourself or just capitulating yeah just capitulating of i'm denying something real that is stirring in me that is the striving by burying it. And of course, as we all know, I think we all know this, then it leads to frustration and resentment. Mm -hmm. uh, So so there really isn't a successful way to to, uh, keep avoiding conflict. Uh, And some of the ways that we do this, um, and I, will credit Gestalt theory for this, is, you know, that's the example of a retroflection of just silencing myself. Mm. All right, I'm just going to let it slide. I'm just going to be the bigger person here again. Um, then there's desensitization, which is just numbing. Mm. 
mm. um, as in just freezing. Of I'm just not going to feel it. Um, then this is a very big one uh, in, of confluence. I'll just match you. I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to join you. And I think about the image for this as being a dance partner with someone who's taking the lead. Mm -hmm. And no matter what that other partner does, whatever kind of crazy steps he or she takes, um, you are in accord. You match it. You join it. Uh, another is projection. We've talked about that many, many a time on the podcast. Of It's not me. It's you, whoever the you happens to be. There is deflection. Make a joke, change the subject. Um, just sort of like, you know, all of a sudden make a, a dog leg turn over to the left. <laughs> of Let's get off this. We do this all the time, uh, especially where things really matter. Uh, there's no should here. But if the conversation gets heavy about, let's say, politics, or religion, or sex, or money. Uh, hey, you know, um, I got to make a phone call. I've deflected. I got off the hot spot. Um, and then there's interjection, where you just swallow it whole. You just gulp it down without chewing it, without integrating it, without really considering it. Uh, and, and put it inside where it stays as a hard, indigestible lump. And we all do all those things. Um, and, of course, we can't go around um, like, you know, knights on horseback <laughs> battling every little bunny rabbit that crosses the path. But we can be aware of, what am I doing? What did I just do? You know, to be curious about ourselves yes. and curious about other people. Mm -hmm. What's driving, or again, what am I striving for? Sometimes it's just, as you were saying, Deb, just striving for harmony. Mm -hmm. And that yes. that's the most important striving. There may be many times where I set aside my own assertions, my own concerns or needs, because harmony is more important, and other times when that's less so. It, it depends upon what one's own motivation is. Exactly. You know, to go back to my um, insignificant example of should we order in Chinese or pizza, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, the other person really, really wants Chinese. It's okay, you know, we'll do that. But let's say it happens again next month and it happens again the, next, the month after that of then, hey, you know, the last couple times when we ordered in, uh, you, you really wanted this and we got that. I think it's my turn this time. Well, and here's, I, I here's what I or want. Maybe order both. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, That's the transcendent sure. function. The, <laughs> but, but I think we're in the realm of discernment. Yeah, Aha. that it requires discernment to know whether a conflict should be avoided. Because Deb, when you were talking about politics, I was thinking, well, some conflicts maybe should be avoided. I mean, in in uh, absolutely in s social situations, there's no need um, to <laughs> to get into a, a fight about politics, in in my opinion, anyway. But mm -hmm. but uh, but we have to ask ourselves. Uh, what is in service to growth? What is in service to wholeness? Is it better mm -hmm. that I just let this go by the boards? It's not that big a deal, Chinese versus pizza. Or does this, is there something larger at stake here, like my ability to advocate for myself or to occasionally right. put my needs first? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, some, some conflicts should be avoided, but, uh, but not all, certainly. So let's yeah. let's bring this over into a different realm. Let's talk mm -hmm. about conflict in the consulting room. And part of what made me think about this is that yeah, a conflict, um, you know, most therapists are recovering nice people. And most <laughs> of us uh, appreciate harmony to sometimes a pathologic degree. 
And, uh, you know, Karen Moroda, the psychoanalyst, remarks that empathy can be overused to avoid mm-hmm. conflict. So mm-hmm. your client comes in and is very angry because you started the session a few minutes late. And you don't want to have it out. So you, you empathize. Well, that you must have been very disappointed. I wonder if it made you feel that you don't matter to me, which is, which is fine. But there, it may not always be in the client's best interest to stop there. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's very important to stand your ground. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, let a conflict happen or let there be strife, Joseph, in mm-hmm. your great framing. Mm-hmm. It, it more often uh, happens maybe around something that is less concrete. Yeah. Of, you know, I was late and I'm sorry and what was that like for you, et cetera. But the part where it could get very interesting is uh how the person really feels of, you know, is there some other resentment? Is, is this just the, the tip of the proverbial iceberg for a bigger issue? Um, and to get interested in that. And also to be able, as an analyst, for me, to hold my ground of, we see this differently. Um, and what I often say to people is if there is something that bothers you, that happens between us, something that didn't fit, you didn't like, it felt wrong, bring it back and I will meet you there. That does mm-hmm. not mean that I'm going to agree or that I'm going mm-hmm. to exceed, but I will meet you there. And that's the interpersonal version of Jung's Hammer and Anvil. Mm-hmm. Of we can talk about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the temperature in the room does not necessarily have to rise up to 212 degrees, the boiling point. Of, let's just sit here with each other. Of when I said this, you thought I meant that. That's not what I meant. Or what if I really do see it differently? Yeah. Uh, it's. Oops. That getting to the place where it's okay, oh, we can go there. N- nobody's going to melt. Well, I, I'm hearing a couple of different um, idea streams here. One, I, one I'd like to speak to, Lisa, where you were starting, um, I think, to bring in this category of there are often two stages in analysis. Murray Stein mm-hmm. uh, languages it this way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And often the work starts in the mother paradigm, and then the work has ah. to evolve into mm-hmm. the father paradigm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so it, it's great. You know, in the mother, because there's often early wounds, there's a lot of compassion, a lot of mm-hmm. um, nurturing, a lot of co regulation, um, so a lot of empathic mirroring. Mm-hmm. And then at a certain point, just as you were saying, Lisa, there gets to this, this stuck place where. Mm-hmm. The analysis starts right. to feel like it's primarily a soothing um, mm-hmm. engine, and at a, and you can begin to feel it either in the analysis and or in the in the field that's constellated, or even in the analyst. Like, is this is this all that going to do for years down the line? Is there mm-hmm. anything more dynamic or challenging to come in? And then often the Father archetype Mm -hmm. begins to come in, and then, you know, the analyst winds up kind of challenging, or encouraging, or trying to, trying to energize something that's forward moving uh, for the Mm -hmm. analyst end that is so important, and that can create um, more of a a demand in the analysis, and uh, things can often heat up, particularly Mm -hmm. if the client really wants to stay in that sleepier comforting place mm-hmm. so yeah. is it is it chinese food or pizza <laughs> or going for a jog a run <laughs> you know right like is it, yeah, exactly. are we always just sating our hunger mm-hmm. is there something more mm-hmm. dynamic or striving or can expectations mm-hmm. come into the room 
like an expectation yeah. maybe. Yes, you realize that I'm often about five minutes late. So is it possible for you to come prepared for that in the waiting room and actually manage mm-hmm. yourself <laughs> in such mm-hmm. a way that we can mm-hmm. actually talk about something else other than the five minutes? Yeah. Because it's so gratifying for you to criticize me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's more of yeah. a father yeah. place of, come on, hey, hey, hey. Yep. Yep. <laughs> And, and we see that reflected in fairy tales of where I, Snow White uh, goes to the new mothering place where she's you know hanging out with the dwarves and they are kind and comforting. Cinderella has a fairy godmother. Uh, but then uh, it gets to, come on now, uh, mm-hmm. you got to develop a little agency. You got you to right. develop some get up and go. Uh, the dwarves can't mm-hmm. take care of you forever. They tried, but they... As ever, they couldn't do it because that belongs to you. Mm-hmm. And what, you know, how do we, how do we hold that uh, with, with another person uh, and develop the ability not just to have conflict, but to separate, of, to become one's, that's what it's in the service of, is to become your your own person rather than, uh, to use your example, of being five minutes late. Mm-hmm. That um, this, this is how things often develop. It is a pattern. Now, the other thing uh, I think that you were talking about, Deb, is the constellation of unfinished business and the unconscious. Yes. So the client has an awful lot of anger at mom, which is unconscious. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, the therapist looks like a bad mom, which then, <laughs> you know, the analysis mm-hmm. hand, you know, is right. really scanning for all of the, you know, the bad mm-hmm. stuff that mom did. Again, exploring it at first. But, mm-hmm. And when there's a lot of tension and it feels like strife, you never do this, Lisa. Have you, you know, and I, blah, 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 just like mom. Mm hmm. So mm-hmm. that kind of strife and conflict yeah. is expected in the container, as you were saying, Deb. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, yeah. it should live here. And at a certain yeah. point, as we were saying, it, it really does not have a very little, if anything, to do with me, the analyst, although we can create a stage here for it to be made visible. But mm-hmm. once it's visible, it still is your work as the analysis and to put mm-hmm. your hands in that big steaming pile and figure out, you know, what's going to be done about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I remember this really extraordinary moment and I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm not going to share names just because I don't know how this person would feel about it, but it was, it was at our training Institute and there was some question about uh, relationships between the analysts and the trainees and, we were candidates and we were kind of griping about something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was some big, very solemn meeting to talk about this. And there were, there was a working group and, you know, we were all kind of grousing a little bit about how unfair something was. And then this elder analyst, this uh, kind of, um, you know, fairly renowned analyst who trained in Zurich, stood up and she said, I don't get what's going on. When we were in training, we just understood that we had to hold the analyst shadows. Mm-hmm. And I was like, my jaw dropped. And Joseph, it's just yeah. like you're saying, like, I mean, not not that if you're the analyst who's always five minutes late, you don't want to see if you can, I mean, that's on you, right? You need to figure out what the yeah. heck is going on with you that you can't show up for your sessions on time. But sort of if you're that analyst and yeah. it's like, can you come to terms with that without having mommy sort of spoon feed you perfection? Uh, right. It was a startling, startling moment to hear her say yeah. that. And I, I don't yeah. think I will ever forget it because it really typifies this attitude of, Deb, what you've said again and again today, kind of taking it in, not seeing the conflict as only out there, but where, where is this in me or how can I have mm-hmm. agency in dealing with it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so not a very yeah. common movement, but a really valuable one. And fairness is very, very big. 
Oh, we are so hardwired for fairness. Yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, and primates know about fairness. Mm -hmm. You know, when the chimpanzees, for example, are given the task of pressing a lever and getting a reward, uh, some of them get a slice of banana and some of them get a little piece of cucumber or celery. And they kind of go like, you know, what's up with that? <laughs> he gets the banana, he I get celery. I like that Reese's yeah. monkey face there. <laughs> you know, that ain't right. Um, and versus that place that you were alluding to, Lisa, of that's right. Uh, analysts are just people. Right. And sometimes we have to know that we know what we know. Yeah. Take, take it in and deal with it internally because we're not going to change this person who has authority and power over us or our boss mm -hmm. or, you know, a hundred other people. Uh, mm -hmm. You have the power. I have the power to see mm -hmm. what I see and know what I know and not have to work it out with the, the you, whoever right. that you, right. Right. whoever that right. you is, which goes to my, my mantra of what do you do when words don't work? Oh, uh, well, my rule is I take it to, not that I obey this rule all the time, but I try, um, I take it to the other person three times. And I'm really intentional and conscious about it. And then I know that words aren't going to work. And this happened with, with me years ago. My husband had a very demanding job. And you know, I worked out in the hinterland, and he worked in the city. And I would ask him to pick up you know, something on the way home. Uh, it might have been to stop at the dry cleaner. It might have been to get some, you know, odd grocery item or something, and he would always say yes. <laughs> and then he didn't do it. <laughs> and I was so mad. I, I was so mad. About, what do I have to do? You was, I called you and you said yes. And I asked you to write it down, and I did all the things that I could think of to do. I called his secretary, I, all these things. But he got on another track. And what do I do when words don't work? Now what am I going to do mm -hmm. with me? Yeah. Can uh, I drop in another quote from Jung that is relevant, I think? Mm -hmm. Jung says, You have no alternative but to take the conflicts on yourself by ceasing to identify now with one side now with the other, you become what happens in the middle. Mm. That takes me back to the hammer and the anvil and, and, and me being that horseshoe in the middle getting banged into shape. Mm -hmm. I really don't like it. Mm -hmm. And yet, there it is. There's also a, a piece that I, I just love in the, a, the serenity prayer in AA. Mm -hmm. Grant me the serenity mm. to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for you, Deb, that you know, I've, I've yeah. tried to change this right with another territory. person three times, and, and that has yes. now given me the wisdom that I cannot change this tree. Yeah, that's exactly you know, right. In, in my husband or my wife. Now I have the courage mm -hmm. <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to figure out what do to do. What I can. What am mm -hmm. I going yes, to do? Yes, to do what I can. And then, of course, you know, what we do in the consulting room, you know, hopefully with ourselves is, you know, it really wasn't about the dry cleaning or picking up, you know, there was a butcher that I particularly liked. It, it really, it's not, if the dry cleaning doesn't get picked up for another couple of days, it's not going to be the end of the world. But the meaning that I made of it was, if you really loved me, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though I'm making a, a small request, that because you love me, you'll mm -hmm. hold on to it and you will do it for me. 
Mm-hmm. That it was symbolic that you were in his of, thoughts that you that right he, yeah right and that goes way back to the very very beginning of we keep the baby in mind mm-hmm. you know every new, every new mother has that baby in mind all day every day when is he going to wake up when is he going to be hungry uh, etc of I wanted to be kept in mind yeah of uh, and it wasn't <laughs> about just, that. He had a stressful, demanding job, and of course his mind went on a hundred other tracks during mm-hmm. his working day, and it's only the dry cleaning. It is not symbolic of his for everlasting, him, right? eternal love for me. <laughs> <laughs> but striving for that evidence of being you know, eternally considered and loved and in mm-hmm. remembrance. How important that is and the underlying fantasy of what that would mean to us if such an experience were to be given. Yeah. It's also, it's powerful that way. The other thing that um, I take in this conversation is about complexes, which we've talked about many times, Mm -hmm. is that we have a complex about something which distorts our ego's ability to be in right relation to the reality. Mm-hmm. And, and we've been saying that in many different ways. But more importantly, that when, uh, when a situation occurs and the intensity of our response seems disproportionate, boy, I'm really, I, I'm ready to yeah. scream about the garage. I, I'm ready to divorce somebody right. because they're not bringing home the groceries uh, that, that they promised they would. That we also need to become, especially when we stepped away a bit, suspicious. Why, why am I so hot about that thing? <laughs> and perhaps much cooler about many other things, which my friend might think I probably should be a little more activated about. So the disproportionate response mm-hmm. should make us suspicious that there's other things yeah. that it's not about what the argument is, but there's something underneath. Right, right. I think conversely, I don't know where Jung wrote about this or where he was interviewed, but he has a vision for the more individuated person who fundamentally feels quite peaceful most of the time. Mm. That, that these outer um, dynamics influence them far less and they're able to maintain a kind of internal equanimity Mm -hmm. things go Mm -hmm. my way oh that's fine things don't go my way oh that's fine this sense that we can be creative and resilient and complete Mm -hmm. unto ourselves in many different configurations of circumstance and configurations of relationship yeah Mm-hmm. And, yes. and that's the promise of the ego finding the self as the primary companion. Mm. That internal companion. So yes. that when outer circumstances disappoint us, disillusion us, frustrate us, scare us, that mm. there's another relationship that is unruffled mm-hmm. by the vicissitudes mm-hmm. of life. Yeah. And that's a rather wonderful promise. It's a wonderful, empowering, steadying uh, promise, and in a way that is so much the goal of of therapy and psychoanalysis. Um, I often use the image of being on the surface of the ocean, and some days it's beautiful and calm and wonderful. Sometimes it's choppy. Uh, sometimes it's really stormy. But if you go down 50 feet, 100 feet, there are swells that go rolling along. But no matter what happens on the surface of the ocean, there's a place down deep where things are steadier, slower moving, calmer. And if we find that place in ourselves, uh, then things don't have to be externalized so much to, you know, what our boss is doing or our partner is doing or, or what is happening out there because something down 100 feet stays okay. 
and can can roll with it. Uh, okay, he didn't pick up the dry cleaning <laughs> again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 oh, hey, sirrah, sirrah, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you know, to make to take it to a more uh, impactful and important level, let's say, you know, that there is a person who um, is partnered with a uh, someone who is really um, perhaps addicted to a substance or terribly irresponsible with money or things that really matter, and it's big. And that's not so easy to say, how do you take that in and take it into yourself and find the empowerment to find your own solution to a very big, very real problem with let's say, your life partner. That's hard work. It is. I'll share and this. if words mm-hmm. don't work, that's where, that's where we go. That we try to work it out with a group. We try to work it out with another person. Mm-hmm. And eventually we have to find a way sometimes to work it out in ourselves. Stay with me for just a brief moment. I hope today's topic resonates with you. And if you're finding value in our conversations and wish to support our community together, here's how you can help us grow and reach more curious minds. First, if you're tuning in on YouTube, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel. It's a simple click for you, but a tremendous support for us. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a quick like goes a long way in helping us reach others who might benefit from these topics. If you're inclined to support us further, and I hope you are, become our patron on Patreon. Your contribution helps us keep the lights on, which is more than a metaphor for consciousness, by the way. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. It's a great way to stay connected, get updates, and join a community of like-minded individuals. Your support means the world to us. It helps keep this Jungian life thrumming along. Thank you for being part of our community. Now let's dive back into our discussion. It reminds me of a moment that was so important to me in our training. That Mm. uh, The training process, uh, the analytic training process was very turbulent for me internally, and I found myself fussing and complaining and hissing and spitting a lot, (laughs) as you guys remember. Didn't we all? (laughs) We all do, but I remember myself for sure. And and as I was preparing for, I think it was probably my uh, final exam, my cases exam, um, I, I had this dramatic shift of tone, of emotional tone. And I experienced this tremendous calmness. And it, it came upon me, and I said this to the uh, analysts, that everything that I was complaining about in the training was only ever happening inside of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just knew That's that exactly to be true. Right. That's yeah. exactly and I right. I felt it. And then oh. because of the, <sighs> the depth of clarity about that, that the circumstances around me in the training program suddenly seemed rather peaceful and yeah, yeah. bureaucratic. <laughs> and I'm going to go and I'll, I'll, I'll yep. take a test and maybe I'll pass the test. Um, but I had this sense that I am fundamentally okay, regardless yes. of how this blip in my right. life goes. Right, right, and, right, right. That really felt mm-hmm. like this descent of grace. But it yeah, also was an totally enormous object lesson for myself. Mm-hmm. And to see how, how it shifted my personality that the analysts, the training analysts, were like squinting at me. They were like, what happened? Because it was such yeah. a, mm-hmm. a dramatic yeah. shift of how I was relating to them. But it's a, it's a great example, Joseph, of how we all do this, right? We take our inner conflicts and we throw them out into the world. We project them out and then we expect people to behave a certain way. And because of that, they often do behave a certain way. 
And then we're off to the races and we're both kind of working off these unconscious scripts. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait a second. I, this, again, this is not my story, so I'm going to tell it in this really oblique way. But I, there was another training candidate who had this kind of epic battle with one of the analysts on his review committee. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of had the same epiphany you did. I don't know that he would language it the same way, but he, he had a dream that um, this analyst was the Wicked Witch of the West and she's just started melting. And then she was standing there and she was just normal, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. so, you know, she'd worn the face of our arch enemy that, that we, we almost need to kind of project that out sometimes. Mm -hmm. But then we can come to this point where like, no, no, this is in me. This is my conflict, for example, about... Mm -hmm maybe my own self-worth or my own fear of failure yes. that I'm somehow putting out there. And um, since I have the floor, I want to share one last uh, quote. And this is such a great quote, but I, I think it goes to everything we've been talking about. To meet one's insoluble and eternal conflict is to meet God. And that's Marie wow. Louise von Franz. Mm -hmm. So when you meet your conflict, then you're in the right place. But you take some courage to meet your conflict and not yeah. avoid it right. or project and, it out. Yeah, that, it's really great. And uh, of that sense of I am worthy uh, that you were talking about, Joseph, and it goes to what you're talking about, Lisa, of I, I'm, I'm worthy. I'm fundamentally okay. And uh, uh, I can do this. I I have what it takes. Of and that's the promise of analysis and of course life. Of we get bigger than our problems. We don't solve a lot of these problems. We just get bigger, and so in proportion they get a little smaller. Of oh well. You know, we can hold the shadow of the analysts. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go get the dry cleaning tomorrow. Uh, it's okay. And we become our own worthy opponent if we can mm -hmm. meet in that place and, and duke it out sometimes with ourselves if that's what it takes. And that all of the categories of things that we've talked about can be put into the, mm -hmm. uh, into the box of tension. Mm -hmm. And tension, just as von Franz is saying, the tension between the ego and the self, or the individual and God, the dynamic tension is what creates consciousness mm. yeah, and growth. That's great. And conflict it's just finding the sweet consciousness. Button. Conflict. Ah, yeah, conflict yeah. as that, that extra dynamic vibrating tension. Yeah. Yes. Makes us awake. And awaken. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe it's where the, the juice is. Yes. I know. That juices. seems like the, the, the summary statement. So maybe it, yes. it's time to. We'll take to the juice dream. to the dream. Absolutely. All <laughs> right. Our dreamer today is a 58-year-old male, and his occupation is a tour operator. He says he's English, but he is currently living in Spain. And he titles his dream, The Seven Demons. I've been invited to a party or reunion. I'm back in London, and I'm with my friend, T. I'm happy to see him. There is the same feeling of wild elation in the air that I experienced at times when I was living in London in my twenties, a dangerous sensation of almost complete abandon. We are drinking in a bar, and the next day I wake up and find three tattoos on the side of my calf of my <laughs> right leg of three phrases, but I can't decipher what they say. Underneath is the tattoo parlor's name. I'm annoyed about the tattoos, but think I'll be able to get some compensation from the parlor because I must have been unconscious when I got them. <laughs> I talk about this with T, who was with me. I can't blame him because we were all drunk or high, and I think it's not a big deal. 
It's the next day. I'm with T, and he is cooking up an experiment. It's exciting, but there is a sense of danger. We are in an old room with flaking plaster on the walls and old pine benches on either side of the room with high wooden stools under them. On the benches, each of the benches, are three or four piles of darkish sand, seven in total. The piles of sand are not big, but they are incubating something like eggs. One starts to move. I'm nervous. T says, don't worry, and starts scraping away the sand, hurrying the hatching process. Inside, it is a red-skinned man. He comes out. Now he's life-size, and I see he has pointed ears. He is a devil, and I'm terrified. Though T is excited, and the fact that he isn't scared seems to protect him and perhaps me from the risk. The devil is elated to be free. He exudes <laughs> self-assurance and purpose and has an immense charisma. He goes around the other piles, helping the others out. The others are not as red as him. Some are blotchy. Some have been asleep for eons. I think the one bench diagonally opposite, furthest from the main devil, is my father. He has slight red blotches like birthmarks and seems less dangerous and not as happy to be reawakened as the main devil, though they are of the same mold. It is like the awakening of vampires, and I am afraid. The dreamer gives us some context, and he writes, When I was fifteen, I fell out with my father. I went to London at eighteen and lived a pretty wild life of experimenting with drugs until I was twenty-seven, when I decided that I'd had enough. T, in the dream, was one of the few friends who I enjoyed a kind of complete hedonistic abandon with. It was a time of excess, which was costly in terms of regret of wasted opportunities at the time when I could have been putting more in and getting more out of life. My father died in 2020 after a long illness. We both decided to accept that we were different and got on. But we were never as close as I think both of us would have liked to have been. Listening to Joseph's account of his own father's death in a couple of podcasts mm -hmm. brings up a lot of emotion for me. Feelings of grief, love, and regret. And he adds that his feelings in the dream were fear and awe at the devil and his huge charisma, annoyance at the tattoo. I don't have tattoos and personally don't like them if they are not of a tribal community. And then he adds a bit more, saying, I associate the tattoo with the unconsciousness of my hedonistic twenties and the mark they left on me. I was afraid and in awe of the devil. I felt pity at seeing my father awaken when he didn't seem to want to. Uh, well, I, um, mm -hmm. I thought when I saw this dream this morning, I thought, wow, this is just really a, kind of a blockbuster dream. And, uh, and it's a difficult dream. There's a lot in here. But I, I'll start, I'll take a first pass at it by saying this. Sometimes when you have dreams that have two parts to them that seem pretty different, it can be interesting to sort of assume that they treat the same subject from two slightly different perspectives. So we have, the, mm -hmm. this is a two-part dream. The first part is the tattoos, and the second part is, you know, this kind of uh, alchemical experiment or something. Mm -hmm. And what I notice is the same about them, other than the uh, presence of tea, um, is that they both have to do with awakenings. Mm. So in the first part, the dreamer wakes up and has this epiphany mm -hmm. that he has gotten these tattoos apparently when he was unconscious. 
The second part, <laughs> obviously, the devils are awakening. But the dream ego is also kind of awakening to some realities. So that, that, uh, that maybe deepens the meaning. For example, he said the t- tattoos he associates, and I think it's fairly obvious, you know, that the tattoos might refer to the way that that experience in his 20s kind of left their mark on him in an unfortunate way. Mm-hmm. Understanding that, yeah. uh, the, laying it on top of the second half of the dream kind of deepens our understanding that a little bit. I'm going back uh, to um, just noticing that the age of the dreamer, uh, he's, he's in his late 50s now, and the dream starts by saying, uh, I've been invited to a party or a reunion of, mm. of revisiting uh, this time when he and his friend T, um, you know, had their days of what we used to call sowing their wild oats. So it's a reunion, and uh, he is marked by the tattoos, and he doesn't like tattoos. And not only that, he has uh, the the tattoo parlor's name, you know. So it's it's not it's sort of like he's uh, wearing a brand, uh, sort of like the the uh, the devil wears Prada kind of thing. And and he has to wake up to this. And then his friend is doing this incubation process of, of eggs. And what comes out is what we might call shadow and certainly his father complex. And here is the time for him to see this uh, as dream images, confront it, and, and deal with it at, from a different stage of life. Uh, that these are devils, he's terrified, and yeah, it's there's like a lot the of awakening. archetypal power. Right. Vampires are very archetypal. They have no feeling, and they have to live off others' life source, which is the symbolic meaning of blood. Uh, and I would be very curious as to why now. Yeah. That, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question, Deb. And I think you're right. Mm-hmm. I think this is kind of revisiting something. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go one more round. I can tell that Joseph is cooking something over there. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> he often does. He's cooking, he's I, I cooking just, eggs. <laughs> oh, yes. Devilish Joseph. Um, so I want to just make one point, which is... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually pull in the idea of the Freudian slip. Um, okay. The dreamer wrote, Joseph didn't read it this way, but the dreamer wrote about his 20s being a time of almost complete abandon, I think is what he meant, but he wrote mm. almost complete abandonment. Mm. And I note that he, he fell out with his father when he was 15. And and then we don't. I'm in my in my imagination. Dad didn't do much to repair that, and mm-hmm. I wonder if the dreamer felt that or the 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 surrounding of it. Even though it may have felt like he left, I, I my my supposition is that he felt tremendously abandoned, and that mm-hmm. that was a time of having been abandoned. It was an abandonment. That he mm-hmm. responded to with a kind of dangerous abandon, which then marked him. And I think you're right, Deb. Something's coming back, and it is interesting to, mm-hmm. to ask why now. Yeah. Uh, what he actually writes is hedonistic abandon with. So he well, found but, an. Go ahead. Yeah, but he does use the term abandonment. Both. But he yes. also abandons with his yeah. friend T. So mm-hmm. here's another ma- a relationship with a masculine figure. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. the masculine figure is a peer. You know, they're yeah. pretty much the same, the same age. There's no real, 
you know, uh, more life development or more maturity. Oh, oh that's a great point. That, and he abandons yeah. him, abandons him in the dream to the exactly. tattoo parlor. He says, yes. "Well, I can't blame T, but T was with him and apparently let mm-hmm. the tattoos happen." So that's a good point. Yeah. And T also lets all these devilish characters. He's the one that is incubating them. So I'm really curious about what you're thinking, Joseph, as our resident alchemist. Well, I'm. Uh, I'll tell you what's uh, percolating is that I think the dream is part of the archetype of the Book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. And if we recognize that the word apocalypse, which is often misunderstood, actually means revelation. And an apocalyptic huh. revelation mm. um, suggests a revelation of such magnitude that the old world is thrown into discord. So in the book of Revelation, there is a time when the great beast reigns supreme, and those who succumb to that receive mm. the mark of the beast, which is a Ooh. kind of tattoo on That's their body. Great. Yeah. Uh-huh. Another aspect of the book of Revelation is that there are seven seals that are broken. Mm-hmm. And when each of the seal is broken, ah. a, a horseman of destruction, but also a horseman of change. Mm-hmm. You know, the first mm-hmm. symbol uh, seal is the white horse and symbolizes the conqueror. The second is the red mm. horse, and is the horse of war, and removes peace from the world. And then the black horse is famine, and the pale mm. horse is death. Oh. And, uh, and so it moves on. So each of the seven seals erupts. Each of the seven piles of sands hatches, and something that is frightening is revealed. Um, one could make a good case for an analysis of the book of Revelation as a profound and often frightening spiritual awakening, which sounds sure. in many ways like a kundalini rising and the activation mm-hmm. of the seven chakras. And when these unconscious vortices become suddenly superpowered mm-hmm. uh, and they erupt, there's an enormous amount of unconscious material that floods. Mm. The individual that suddenly, you know, has to somehow be dealt with. Mm-hmm. And often there's a, an enormous amount of tension and strife and and shock, conflict, uh, conflict, massive conflict. <laughs> if this proceeds yeah. in the right way, what there is a new Jerusalem suspended yeah. in the heavens, mm-hmm. which descends like a great cube into the earth or onto the earth, and the Lamb of God is the great illuminating force, which is a symbol of a new personality where the self is the primary vital spark Mm -hmm. of the new personality at the end of it. So I would wonder if the um, beginning process of being dissolute in a certain way and enjoying mm-hmm. it, as we often do in mm-hmm. our 20s. Just as he said, has left the quote-unquote mark of the beast on him. And he's mm-hmm. curious about that. And yeah. whether or not that's something that he's okay with. T is a kind of psychopomp in the dream that yeah. companions the ego through this dissolute time, does not mm-hmm. interfere with his unconscious choice to receive the mark, but is Mm -hmm. present to it. The dream ego at times seems like he'd like to put the authority or onus on someone else. Oh, it's not me, it's a tattoo parlor, you Mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Somebody else kind of dragged me along for something rather than now I have to suffer. But the psychopomp T does this remarkable, like you said, alchemical process or apocalyptic process of displaying at least the seven piles of sand and what is inside of this fellow that hatches. Mm -hmm. The red devil 
is part of that libidinal dynamism. And if we remember that the devil, at mm-hmm. least in Christianity, is modeled very explicitly off the pagan Pan, who is yes. the great libidinal engine of nature, mm-hmm. which uh, stood very much at odds with the very conscious, restrained process of, of Christianity. One is supposed to put all of that primal stuff away in order to lead a pure life. So there's a different attitude about Pan. That Pan emerges mm-hmm. from the sand and now is kind of devilish and scary and dangerous. That's different from the first half of life when Pan was the great shameless companion mm. um, who was like leading us into this Arcadian world of drink and excess. <laughs> but here there's a different, or I think the beginning of a certain moral stance, which is, I don't know if that stuff is really good for me. And that might actually be more of a devilish impulse, but I have to kind of figure out whether or not I stand against that whether or not I go with it, what, what, does, what does that mean? And of course, in the mm-hmm. moment, he's anxious. That fear of pan could also be the beginning of wisdom. When we're young, mm-hmm. all that libidinal yeah. wildness, which I know very well, God knows, yeah. all of that <laughs> drunken waking up like, what the heck happened stuff, yes, it is euphoric, and we call it dissolute because it is a great salutio. You know, our Mm -hmm. our ego dissolves into this ecstatic, instinctive pool. Mm -hmm. So the devil comes out of the sand, and the guy's like, oh, oh, (laughs) what's my relationship to that now that I see it? Perhaps in this other way. The progression of figures that emerges seems to have less and less of the devilishness in it until the final... uh, people, including his father, just have little red patches on them. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of devilishness in it, Mm. instead of just the full possession of the devilishness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What it suggests to me, and perhaps is the beginning of some healing work with the father complex, is that the dreamer is like his father, in as much as he too has devilish patches on him. Mm -hmm. But it is it is only a part of him. That, that mm-hmm. It is not a full possession of the devilish, unbridled instinctiveness, but kind of a rash, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And we can mm-hmm. imagine the red rash of the Father and the way that all of us have a devilish rash that rises up in us and we become highly mm-hmm. instinctive which could be very renewing sometimes, but can also get us into a lot of trouble, depending on what our yeah. relationship is to the impulses. Uh, I, I love what you did, Joseph. I, I think that's just something. And I, you come up with this stuff, I'm like, wow, I never in a million years would have gone there. That's just great. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to just walk around it in a slightly different way, I think, mm-hmm. not, not in any way contradicting anything you said, but but maybe just um, sharpening my own sword here. Uh, You know, my fantasy is that uh, there was this incredibly painful rupture with the father that the dreamer never really allowed himself to feel. He Mm -hmm. says, uh, just to go back to it for a minute, he says, um, when I was 15, I fell out with my father. He's kind of putting it all on himself. I went to London at 18, and I lived this pretty wild life. Um, my father died in 2020 after a long illness. We both decided to accept that we were different and got on, but we were never as close as, as I think we both wanted to be. So somehow there was this really remarkable rupture at a young age that it seemed like it was like, oh, well, you know, we're just different. We're just going to agree to disagree. And I imagine that there's a lot of unmetabolized pain around that and probably also some unmetabolized anger. And I like what you said about T being a psychopomp. I think he's also, in a, if we're going to talk about kind of classical Jungian formulation, he's a shadow figure. And he, mm. he is leading the dreamer through this dissolute time in the 20s, which 
which in some sense I think was a real reaction to the break with the father. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go mm-hmm. kind of, um, for, you know, numb myself basically to this awareness and kind of live in this slightly self-destructive way as we sometimes do when we've suffered a, a real kind of traumatic break. And, and then T is the one that says, you know, this is not going to stay buried under, sta- under sand you know, we're, we, there's going to be a confrontation here. And that is, you know, sometimes shadow makes us look at what we don't want to look at. And, and part of that is this red hot anger, this devilish anger that I imagine maybe the dreamer has been afraid of his own mm-hmm. anger. He's afraid of the devil. And like you said, it kind of devolves and then it's his father. So it's, it's like the whole panoply of uh, confusing feelings about this father relationship all the way down to like pity. He's just an old guy who wants to stay dead. But, you know, in the dreamer psyche, he's not dead. This is still a conflict that's very much alive and is continuing to influence the dreamer, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, I too was really amazed uh, that you could take it to the book (laughs) of Revelation and the seven seals. um, Because there's something reassuring when there's really an archetypal theme yeah. uh, that this is part of universal human experience of uh, all kinds of mythology and that the first figure that emerges is this full-blown red man the devil but as other figures emerge they're blotchier they're more humanized mm-hmm. promising that it these are metabolizable uh, th- this is stuff you're ready to deal with. And then I think the telos, the promise that you mentioned, Joseph, is the new Jerusalem, the new beginning, is where Psyche says, time to go there. And I think what tickled my imagination was that in one of the pad- podcasts that I had said that in the final moment of my father's life, the night before he died, He was kind of petting my hand and was saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. I am going to Jerusalem. That's right. I don't know if the dreamer remembers that particular story, but I did. So so I I found myself thinking about the new Jerusalem, Jerusalem, seven piles of sand, and the way the synchronicities just tickle together. Wow. That's amazing. But what I loved what we did is that there's an amplification part, which is Mm -hmm. really interesting, the seven seals, but also, Lisa Dev, you guys tied it into this very human dynamic that we also could see, Mm -hmm. and and it's all um, It's all there. It's all there. It's all all there. suggestively there, which lets us know that our personal suffering also has a deep and archetypal dimension to it, which is why it's so meaningful. And it has a And in terms... And in ter- right, and in terms of Telos, there's that lovely synchronicity, Joseph, that you just brought up about the New Jerusalem. I also want to say that the devil, the little devil coming out of this egg, mm-hmm. reminds me a bit of Mercurius, the the kind of spirit in the bottle uh, right. from the Grimm's fairy tale, which is you know this incredibly powerful force that must be channeled correctly. But when it's channeled correctly, as in the Grimm's fairy tale, the, the, I think it's called The Spirit in the Bottle, um, it gives, the, the gift that it gives is healing. It can heal anything. So uh, that is also Telos there. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.